Welcome back to the CRP. This is Devin and this is a CRP News Roundup. It is Monday, September the 2nd, 2019. And over the weekend, we saw the UFC return to mainland China. And it was a UFC on ESPN Plus 15. And it was headlined by a UFC women's strawweight title bout between new champion Jessica Andraj and China's own Whaley Zong. And we saw Whaley Zong KO Jessica Andraj in just 42 seconds of the first round to secure the UFC women's strawweight title. And now the question going forward with this is what is next? You got this new star in China, Whaley Zong, 20 and one, she's on a 25 win streak, 4-0 in the UFC, clearly a very talented force. And when it comes to Andraj, I had been kind of labeling her for a long time the Vanderlei Silva of women's MMA. The, just the way she fights, the way she would throw the big hooks, trudge forward and uh, with the big power. But watching this fight, I, I'm not, I think I got it wrong. I think she's more like the Chris Lieben of women's MMA. And this fight to me looked a lot like the breakthrough performance that Anderson Silva had when he first came into the UFC against Chris Lieben. It, I'm not sure the Whaley Zhang really missed a shot. It just She just completely blitzkrieged Jessica. Jessica came trudging forward. She's gotten so used and comfortable with being able to just push forward, eat shots, and her power being able to overwhelm her opponents at the small, at the small weight division for women's MMA. Not this time. She walked into a big right hand early on and then it took a big elbow in the clinch and then Whaley just pounced, dropped her, and the fight was over. New champion. And she was getting picked apart, and Drajad is, against Rose Namajunas a lot really bad in the first round of their title fight before the infamous slam KO in the second round. So Jessica Andraj has got to go back to the drawing board and sharpen up on her defense at this higher level because she's not going to just be able to just walk through the shots it, just to take one to give one against some of these some of these women that um, have this kind of power. And Whaley Zhang became an instant star. And as I mentioned, what's next? What's next for Whaley Zhang? I mean, obviously they could run it back with Jessica and Draj. I don't think anybody expects that to happen or even wants that to happen. Rose Namajunas, I think, would be the best option again. Um, but that's just that's a matter of whether Rose is wanting to fight right now. I think that's a very interesting fight. I would like to see her or Joanna because I want to see Whaley take on somebody that isn't going to trudge forward and walk right into the, to her counter strikes. I want to see her fight somebody that is going to be able to have really good footwork and want to fight her at range. The other option, I think, would be, as I mentioned with Joanna, the Joanna Michelle Watterson winner. Um, both of them are good strikers. Both of them are on good runs. And Joanna's a former uh, strawweight champion. She went up to try to fight. She lost the two bouts to Nami Yunus, tried to fight Valentina Shevchenko for the 25 belt. So, um, you know, she's at kind of a crossroads in her career. But I think that that's an interesting fight would be with her and Whaley. And I think that she would still beat Jessica Andraj had she gotten this fight. Um, Tatiana Suarez is still kind of floating out there. She's a big time, really good wrestler. She is undefeated in the UFC and in this in entire MMA career. I think she's an opportunity. So Whaley Zhang, though, she um, very impressive in this fight. As I mentioned, I, I'm kind of compare it to when Anderson Silva really had his breakthrough performance in his UFC debut against Chris Lieben. Uh, it was just masterclass. And she really exposed Jessica Andrade's holes in her defense as she came trudging forward. And also on this card, it was another. It was a big night for China because in the co-main event, we saw Jinglang Li knock out the charging and um, just really underrated Eliza Zaleski Dos Santos in the third round after completely dominating the fight um, with his counter striking and with his power and. Lee now improves to nine and three in his UFC tenure. He's seventeen and five overall. And Dos Santos came into this bout on a seven fight win streak, reg number fourteen in the division. So this was a hard setback for him, who was on a great streak and really starting to get some good attention. But Jinglong Lee, China's own, goes in there in his home turf, knocks him out, 
dominates the bout, is probably going to have a number next to his name now, has a stellar UFC resume, and I think he looks like a strong contender. Zaleski never came even close to trying to get this fight into a grappling scenario, and he just did not have the firepower um, to hang with Lee. Lee's striking looked very good, and he looks like he has a lot of power, a lot of horsepower behind those um, behind those paws. So very impressive performance by Jinglong Lee, and um, I'm interested to see where he goes from here in this just incredibly stacked division at welterweight. And there's one more fighter that I want to note here on this card in the recap of UFC on ESPN Plus 15 in China is Kai Cara France, who defeated Mark De La Rosa by unanimous decision. Cara France came in ranked number 10 at the flyweight division. 26 years old, he's 3-0 in his UFC tenure. And when we look at this whole division as a whole, this is a division that we weren't even sure was still going to be around at the beginning of the year. It, um, Henry Cejudo is the champion, but he's also the champion of Bantamweight. He moved up. Demetrius Johnson's fighting over in one championship now. It, there's very little n- name notoriety in the depth of this division, and there has been a lot of rumors and a lot of uh, speculation that they were going to close in on this division because it just hasn't been profitable for them. I think that would be a mistake. I think this was a great fight. I think Cara France looked very good, and I'm very interested to see him fight a top-five ranked contender after this. And um, I would I really hope that this division gets some new stars and gets some new name notoriety to uh, to complement what I believe there's a lot of talent in this division and uh, really bring the spotlight on um, a division that I think is really underrated, under overlooked, and underappreciated. But moving on from here, we just did our recap, so now we got to look forward. Khabib versus Dustin Poirier, UFC 242, is this Saturday, and the UFC is returning to the United Arab Emirates into Abu Dhabi. This main card, I believe, will be starting about 2 p.m. Eastern time in the States. It will not be a typical pay-per-view. It's going to be a daytime event. This will be exclusively on ESPN+. Plus. All UFC pay-per-views are now. you got to buy it through there. And as I mentioned, it's going to be a headlined. It's going to be headlined by a UFC lightweight title bout that's very highly anticipated between dominant champion Khabib Nurmagomedov taking on the UFC blood and guts veteran Dustin the Diamond Poirier. And Khabib Nurmagomedov doesn't really need any introduction. Ten and zero in the UFC, twenty seven and zero overall in his MMA career. Arguably the most dominant fighter in the sport. One of the greatest of all time, coming off his win in probably the biggest fight in UFC history against Conor McGregor last October. And he's also coming off a big suspension from his infamous jumping of the cage and going at Conor's corner, notably Dylan Danis, after the bout, where he gets suspended by the Nevada Athletic Commission. And um, because of that suspension, that could be got, they ended up instituting a interim title bout. And this turned out they tried to make it between Max Holloway and Tony Ferguson. Tony Ferguson, for whatever reason, declined, and they ended up getting Max Holloway versus Dustin the Diamond Poirier, which was a rematch. And Dustin Poirier goes in and steals the show of the night and wins the bout against Max Holloway to become the interim champion and earn his shot with Khabib later on in the year that will be consummated this Saturday in Abu Dhabi. And Dustin Poirier, you know, so underrated, so underappreciated, a veteran of 22 UFC bouts, 17-4 and four with one no contest in those bouts. And he's got two wins over Max Holloway. He's got a win over Justin Gaethje, Eddie Alvarez, Anthony Pettis. He's been around forever. And he is the definition. I mean, it, it really actually got me kind of emotional watching the countdown and him talking about, you know, he didn't even finish ninth grade. And he's earned everything that he has with his fists. And it was really powerful to see. And I think that he's somebody that the fans really gravitate toward. He always brings it. The UFC has been rewarding him with main event after main event after main event on fight nights. And here he is getting a chance to go in and shock the world against the dominant force that is Khabib Nurmagomedov. Khabib, obviously big win over Conor McGregor, Ally Quinta, Edson Barbosa, Michael Johnson, Rafael Dos Anjos. Nobody's really been able to slow him down. The only time we've ever really seen him tested at all was his bout with Gleason Tebow. And Gleason Tebow was most likely doped up on um, a lot of PEDs at the time. So 
Khabib has just been completely dominant. If he wins this, it probably finally sets up the showdown with Tony Ferguson that a lot of fans, a lot of hardcore fans have wanted for a long time. They've kind of cleared out this great division. But also, obviously, the the Conor McGregor rematch is on the table there. And so there, I think there's a lot of potential big fights for, for Khabib if he keeps winning going forward. But he's also mentioning kind of retirement. I think that he is going to be one of those guys that's going to walk away early if he gets a few more big fights and gets a few more dominant wins because it's not going to take much for him to maybe have a strong argument as the greatest fighter we've ever seen. And um, he, he, I don't think that he's really has the mindset that a lot of people do in the West about money and um, status. I think that he just wants to do what he needs to do to prove who he is and who what his worth is and then walk away into the sunset and go uh, live with his family in Dagestan and be happy. So th- but this is a great bout. Also on this card, UFC 242 this Saturday on ESPN+. Plus, we got Edson Barbosa taking on Paul Felder in what is a rematch from a July 2015 bout in which Barbosa won by unanimous decision, but that was an absolutely epic bout. These are two guys that always bring it, great strikers. Paul Felder is somebody who's been fighting with broken hands and broken ribs and all sorts of stuff, and Edson Barbosa, some of the greatest highlight real knockouts we've ever seen. Barbosa coming in ranked number six in the lightweight division. Felder coming in ranked number 10 in the division. So big opportunity for Felder to move forward, and um, this is a big opportunity for Barbosa just to stay stay where he's at and get another win on his resume. I also want to highlight Islam Makashev, who is the teammate of Khabib Nurmagomedov, very similar in style, coming in ranked number 15 at the lightweight division. He's taking on Davey Ramos, who's on a four-fight UFC win streak. Makashev, 27 years old, 17-1 and in MMA, 6-1 and in the UFC. He's on a five-fight win streak. As I said, very similar to Khabib Nurmagomedov. Uh, very heavy grappling. I mean, I'm uh, just in, insane grappling prowess and very gritty fighter. And um, he was actually involved in the whole altercation after the Khabib uh, McGregor bout that almost saw him face his suspension too. But um, he's back taking on Davy Ramos here in Abu Dhabi, which is a prime. The UAE obviously is a primarily Islamic country, so this is a good opportunity for both these Islamic. Um, competitors to have a good stage where they're going to have a legit fan base around them and also on this card going down a little bit we got a battle of ranked heavyweights between number four ranked curtis blades and number nine ranked shamil abdur akimov and blades really has been flawless in his ufc tenure other than his two losses to francis Ngannou. he's 11 and 2 in mma 6 and 2 overall he just came off a big win over justin willis he's 28 years old and when we look at Shamil Abder Akimov, he is 20 and 4 in MMA, 5 and 2 in the UFC, on a three fight win streak, 38 years old. And as I mentioned, he's coming in ranked number nine. Curtis Blades is coming in ranked in the top five in the contendership with number four in the, with a number four rank. So that's a big opportunity for Shamil to move forward. Curtis Blades, I think, is somebody that has, I mean, he's got wins over Alistair Overeem and. Um, you know, as I mentioned, he just came off a big win over Justin Willis. Very strong wrestler. Um, knocked over him out from the guard with elbows. Um, has a lot of uh, has a lot of potential. Um, he just he's just somebody that's ran into Francis Ngannou twice and got blitzkrieged both times. But great fighter, and this is a big opportunity for this for both for Shamil to move forward and Curtis Blades to continue where he's at in the top five in the rankings. And one last fight because I like to highlight ranked. Bouts, we got a women's flyweight bout that's actually pretty pivotal. You got a number five ranked Joan Calderwood, 33 years old, 13 and 4 in MMA, 5 and 4 in the UFC. Just came off a loss against the number two ranked Caitlin Chukagian. She's taking on number six ranked Andrea Lee, who's 30 years old, 11 and 2 in MMA, and 3 and 0 in the UFC. As I mentioned, number six ranked Andrew Lee going against number five Grant Calderwood. Lee's really on a good run, 3-0 and in, in her UFC tenure. Calderwood kind of fighting to stay where she's at. She's borderline 500 in her UFC tenure. She moved up to 125 from 115 pounds. Has looked better, but still, as I mentioned, just came off a loss to Chukagian. I think it's going to be a very, very interesting fight. I think both these girls are going to strut and stand and strike with each other. I think Angela Lee's a little bit more of a complete 
Um, fighter, I think she's a little bit better in the clinch, a little bit better boxing. But I think it's going to be an interesting bout, and I'm actually I'm actually looking forward to it. But when we look at that flyweight division, it's just man, who's going to be who is really going to be Valentina Shevchenko anytime soon? But moving on, also this weekend we got to throw some uh, coverage for Bellator 226, which will be live on the Zone Saturday night. And it's going to be headlined by a Bellator heavyweight title bout between Ryan Bader taking on the challenger Chet Congo, who is on an eight-fight win streak in Bellator, including a win over former Bellator heavyweight champion and, undef- and really serving up his first loss, Vitaly Minikov. <clears throat> when we look at Ryan Bader, though, comes into Bellator, wins the light heavyweight be- belt from Phil Davis, goes on to just completely run through the Bellator heavyweight Grand Prix. He gets two... Knockouts in less than a minute over King Mo and Fedor Emelianenko. And he just wins a five-round decision by just completely ragdolling Matt Mitrion for five rounds. It wasn't even competitive. And, um, you know, so now he's the champ champ. He's the champion at heavyweight. He's the champion at light heavyweight. Didn't even get hit in that Grand Prix, as I mentioned. Congo, eight-fight win streak in Bellator. Really on a good run. Big guy. But I just, I don't, it's it's hard to think he's going to have the wrestling to really compete with Ryan Bader right now and Ryan Bader's gotten a lot of criticism because he goes over to Bellator and is just dominating when he he could not get close to a title fight. I mean he he was a, he was always a ranked top ranked contender at heavy at light heavyweight in the UFC, but when he met up with guys like um John Jones and Anthony Johnson, you saw the you saw the level change. So um there's some criticism there, but yet nevertheless You know, I don't want to hate on Ryan Bader. He's been doing great since he's been going into Bellator, and he might be Bellator's best fighter. So, um, you know, that's an interesting bout. I expect Ryan Bader probably to win this pretty handily, but nevertheless, good bout. What I'm more looking forward to on this Bellator 226 card is it starts off the the Bellator um, Featherweight Grand Prix, and there's going to be four bouts in the 16-man tournament um, that are going to take – the front that are there's gonna be eight fighters, four fights in the first round of this 16 man Grand Prix happening on this card. And when we look at this featherweight Grand Prix, this is the third Grand Prix that Bellator's had. They kind of went back to the pride days of reinstituting this Grand Prix mentality where you know they're gonna have these divisions, they're gonna bundle up all the top ranked guys of these divisions and have them fight in a tournament. And I, I really think it's been exciting. The heavyweight one didn't go over too well. Ryan Bader won that, as I mentioned. This welterweight one that they just had did go over very well. And it's going to be f- fulfilled here soon later this year when the rematch between current champion Roy McDonald taking on Douglas Lima and the, Uf- and the Bellator welterweight title bout in the finale of their Grand Prix. This featherweight one I think will be the best one yet. And starting us off on this card at Bellator 226, we're going to have Der- Der- Daniel Strauss, former Bellator featherweight champion, taking on Derek Campos. Pat Curran taking on Adam Borix, who just got a, a knockout over um, Aaron Pico. Emmanuel Sanchez taking on Taiwan Claxton, which a lot of people are very high on. And Sam Cecilia taking on Pedro Carvalho. So um, those are the first four fights. And the other four bouts of the first round of this Grand Prix will be at Bellator 228, September 28th in Inglewood, California. And just briefly scanning through some other news, um, Colby Covington versus Kamaru Usman title bout is being has been confirmed by Data White that it's looking like it's going to be at UFC 244 in Madison Square Garden in November. When we look at Covington, Obviously, seven fight win streak coming off wins over Robbie Lawler, Rafael dos Anjos, and Damian Maya, former interim welterweight champion. Never lost that belt. They just, you know, just moved on with the division. Kamaru Usman, ten and zero in the UFC. Won the title from Tyron Woodley back in the co-main event at UFC 235 back in March by unanimous decision. Completely dominated him. This, these two have been going at each other for a long time with the war of words on social media and in interviews and stuff. There's a lot of hype behind this bout. Very much looking forward to it. And I, I expect this to be a strong enough draw that it will be able to main event the big card in Madison Square Garden in November. But, you know, we could we could maybe see a main event um, that will take precedence over this. But I, I, I think that this will be the main event with a big, strong co-main event. And then in other news... Very sad news. Um, there's just more on the BJ Penn controversy. And I don't want to really get into it too much. We've heard allegations of him 
doing this before, getting in fights at bars with neighbors and all this stuff and um, domestic battery allegations and stuff. And in this, there's a TMZ video. There's a video that TMZ obtained where uh, BJ's fighting in a bar and gets knocked clean down by some guy that he's fighting with and looked like he got knocked out, um, head hit the semen, everything. And he's on the longest losing streak of in UFC history. Almost has a 500 record at this point. This is a guy who at one point was considered maybe the pound-for-pound pound best fighter on the planet. And has completely tarnished his legacy. He's getting in trouble outside the cage. He's clearly not mentally stable. And the UFC at this point is approving about between him and longtime rival Nick Lentz that that's going to happen before they cut the cord on BJ Penn, which I think is ridiculous. And the only thing I really have to say about this, because we've been through this so much with BJ Penn and his outside the cage antics and where he's at at this point in his career, we all know anybody who's been following MMA for the past few years knows and understands the trouble that is BJ Penn right now. I th- I think that we're gonna have to have, have a talk on the CRP about this soon. About the, there's got to be some culpa- culpability um, with sanctions and promoters who are gonna endorse this, who are gonna allow this to con- continue. Um, I think it's exploitive, uh, and I'm not even I don't even really come from that persuasion to look at just exploit exploitation of voluntary labor, but when it comes to this. There's no reason. There's no. There's absolutely nothing to gain from throwing BJ Penn on a card right now. It's basically feeding him to the lions at this point. He's he's not mentally stable. He's not emotionally stable, and he's clearly not. He's just not even a shell. I mean, he is a. He's nothing compared to the fighter that he once was. So I think that there needs to be some kind of. Um. Responsibility laid, maybe not so much on the promoters who are just trying to make the money, but the sanctions. There's no reason that they should be approving and in, in rubber stamping in their their seal of approval on this bout. So, um, I hope BJ finds the help that he that he needs. I hope that he, um, you know, gets gets whatever kind of counseling he needs to improve himself spiritually and emotionally and mentally and move on and straighten up his life because he's clearly on the wrong path the wrong trajectory at this stage in his career and it's just very disheartening to see because I was a big fan of BJ Penn growing up and um yeah it's it's just you can just add him to the line of people that of athletes and entertainers and all this stuff that are just self-destructing in their personal life stay tuned to the CRP we'll talk more about these issues coming up And uh, just hit the subscribe button, hit the like button if you have not yet. Talk to you next time.